Hello everybody and welcome to this week's episode of Twice Removed. Um, I'm Natalie, I'm a genealogist called, uh, who runs, blah, 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 words, words just failed me there, sorry. I'm <laughs> a genealogist who runs a business called Genealogy Stories. I was trying to avoid saying genealogy twice and totally failed there. Um, and a, um, a club called the Curious Descendants Club and um, I'm joined here by a fantastic genealogist, um, Emma Jolly. Hi Emma, lovely to have you here. Hi Natalie. Hi there, how are you this evening? I'm good, thank you. Looking forward to saying genealogy lots of times, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I bet if it would be awful to do Italian at the end, it would be huge. There's like, they feel like there should be more words for genealogy other than just genealogy or family history. So they, they don't even quite mean the same thing. No, they don't they? mean the same thing. Like, it's yeah. very hard to kind of keep your, your text flowing and interesting when there's so such a limited vocabulary. <laughs> anyway, random. Um, so Emma, can you tell me how did you um, discover family history? How did you get interested in family history? Uh, okay, so to link this to my um, um, Black Country links and the, the theme of today. So because I had it, there were a few different things, but um, I was brought up um, with my grandparents. So I lived with my maternal grandparents who were from the Black Country. And um, you know, I spent lots and lots of time with them. And so they would be telling me their stories and all about their childhood and just just little things. So it's you know I'd come back from school or I'd go to the dentist and they'd tell me about their dentist experiences, which were horrific. They hated all dentists. <laughs> they didn't have any their own teeth. Um, and then um, and you know they just mention things about um, people committing suicide in canals and. You know, we'd be watching television. Something would happen, you know, happen on, to some characters on the TV, and then they'd be they'd tell me stories and. Yeah, so it, I was always trying to work out what was going on. So I used to get my little exercise books and bits of paper and try and draw the family trees. And so Grandpa was quite cooperative with this, and he would join. You know, he would tell me the, the names, and so I'd write it all down. And he he was quite easygoing and relaxed. Um, but my grandma, there'd been some issues in her family, and so I'd say, "What was your mum called?" She said, "I don't know." <laughs> so, what was, your, what was your dad? But she liked her dad, um, so she would talk about him. But um, and then I would say, "What were all your brothers and sisters called?" And she, I said, oh, "I don't know. I don't know what they're called." And then um, and she, there, would, there would be some of them that she would mention, and and um, she had a brother who was famous. Um, he was called Harry Harrison. And um, so when he died, the local newspaper described him as the bard of the Black Country. He was a stand-up comedian and. Um, a writer and a dialect poet. He wrote um, um, poems in the Black Country dialect. Okay. And so we, we had some in, in the house, so it's a couple of his books, and then um, they were grandpas. And then um, I used to look at them and I couldn't understand them at all. I had no idea what, what they were saying. So that was something that um, I've, I've become more interested in that now. You know, because when I was a child, it was just incomprehensible. And then um, the way grandpa spoke, he had quite a strong accent. Um, compared with grandma's so but grandpa died when I was 10 so I just had those few years um, with him but um, grandma because grandma was so mysterious about some of her relatives uh, um, it did um, it did raise my interest and curiosity and sort of thing but what was yeah that? I bet that would they would definitely pique your interest there's almost the more you say no I'm not going to tell you the more interested you are yeah exactly <laughs> I quite often joke with my daughter because she's uh, she's only eight, but she's started already showing quite an interest in family history, and uh, she loves history generally. And um, I've quite often said to her, "I'm going to delete everything before you're an adult, so you have to go out and rediscover it all yourself." That would be very mean because there's always so much to do. You know, like I, would, the, I the, wouldn't the really do it. Never finished. There's always another layer to add to it. There's always so much. So, so grandma. I mean, it, it turned out that she had she was one of ten. And so she'd mentioned some of the siblings. There was um, her sister called May who'd moved to Scotland to Dumfries and Galloway. And then um, she used to mention her, like she was the one who was closest in age. And then she'd mention her sister Dorothy, she said that they used to share a bed, my sister May, my sister Dorothy, she just like that. And then um, she took this um, brother, Harry Harrison. So Harry's actually got a blue plaque. It's not, a, it's not an English heritage plaque. It's um, one that um, the local organization did. And it's on the side of the community center in Tipton. Okay. In, in that country, because um, it was supposed to be on the house, the house where they all lived, where they grew up, but it's all been knocked down. 
Like, um, I actually went on a trip in the um, to the Black Country a few years ago, and I'd written down all the names of the streets and I'd plotted it all on a map. And I'd gone, and nothing was there. Nothing. It was awful. And um, even the the churches, because I'd um, gone back, you know, back to the 18th century on on some of the lines, and then um, um, the churches that are there were not the churches that my ancestors were married and baptized in. So yeah, so you've got to check that on Januki is the best one for that if you want to check. Yeah, it's a great site. And how do you is how do you feel when you when you go to a place and the history is gone or it's not it's not there, it's all been modernized, or even if it's like a later period than when your ancestors were there, do you find that affects how much you connect to it? Or do you think Okay, so I've, I've, <laughs> these are leaflets that I prepared earlier. So this is the uh, oh, the, the things, right. So uh, this is the Black Country Living Museum, right? And this is, if you have ancestors from the Black Country, you are blessed because um, this is where you will get an idea of what your ancestors' lives were, were actually like. And so I went there with my mum and then, um, you know, she was walking around and said, oh, it was like this. I remember this. I remember this. And then, and, um, and, you know, the schoolroom is more like the schoolrooms that my um, grandparents were in. And, you know, the, the shops are like the shop. My um, family had shops in the Black Country in Tipton. So um, it was really nice to see shops and they have all these shops. They've literally recreated buildings. They're the buildings that were in parts of the Black Country and they've rebuilt them brick by brick within the Living Museum. So, okay. it's, yeah, that's where you've got to go. But it's, it's yeah, you're really lucky. because I think there's Beamish in the Northeast, another Living Museum, but there aren't very many. And the yeah. Black Country Living Museum is fantastic. And they all just do such great work. And um, there's loads of um, academics who are working with them now. And they, they sponsor all these academics to look at things like brick making, which is um, one of my ancestors, one of my great great grandmothers, Anne Edwards. She was a brick maker. And it's, um, you know, it's very exciting that they're exploring these lives and the techniques and the skills because it's, um, it's an area of um, skill. You know, it's an area of industry and the skills that our ancestors had were amazing and it's it, um so many of our ancestors from that area because they were so poor they weren't really respected and so you know people sometimes say oh they only want to have rich ancestors or famous ancestors or something and it's um and it's really um it's sort of kind of offensive to our ancestors it's, it's really you know disrespectful to them that they had all these skills and they could do these amazing things and um you know it's i think it's um uh a responsibility really to find out what they could do and how they lived no I completely agree actually I think that's a really good <laughs> point I mean I quite often think of the stamina that my poorer ancestors had just that just that will to survive and to get up and to do something that was a drudgery day in day out with very little creature comforts when you got home um but I hadn't thought about it that way and I, I you know and I have you know like you I have brick makers and then I have basket weavers and they quite often they are um trades and traditions that are being forgotten um but yeah no i think i went to the black country museum when i was a kid am i yeah. thinking, is it near the iron bridge is it attached to the um, iron bridge? am i muddling up no no places? that's different so iron bridge is in shropshire okay. and the black yeah. country museum is studley in, in the back yeah country. see i think we did a try i think why i get confused over this and i'll be i will get you to clarify exactly where the black country is because i think one of the reasons i get confused by this is i think my grandparents took us on a trip where we traveled up the country or across the country and went to different museums and one of the things that i think we did was the black country museum i think is do you get pennies you go in and get old money Possibly. <laughs> it's really good. I'm sure it's really good. And actually, Sue Adams, who's clearly been there much more recently than my distant oh, right, okay. Black Country Museum is a fabulous tip. Follow the kids' parties around to get a full flavour from excellent guys. That's a really yeah, great tip. Yeah, that's, that's a great really tip. Um, okay, so uh, go on. You, yeah, so you were asking me, yeah, you were asking me where the Black Country is. So I've just yeah. got like an official definition up here. Um, so it's the area where the 30 foot coal seam comes to the surface. Okay. So it includes West Bromwich, Oldbury, Blackheath, Cradley Heath, Old Heath Hill, Bilston, includes Coesley, which is where my family from, Dudley, Tipton, where my grandma's from, Wensfield, um, Hales, uh, parts of Hales Owen, Wensbury, Walsall. And this is saying not Wolverhampton. I would say it 
is all around them. Okay, <laughs> so yeah. I'm sure this is saying it. And it's saying um, it's not Stour Bridge. I think I'd probably agree with that, although it's on the edge. So, And then it's saying not Smethwick. And so my great grandfather, he was from Smethwick. So I would say that's. It's one of those, so it's a bit of a controversial one about where the water <laughs> exactly is. The one thing it definitely isn't is Birmingham. Okay. So that's something that people do get confused about because they think, oh, the accent's similar. It's not the yeah. same. It's, it's similar. Okay. But that was saying, because um, Peaky Blinders, they film a lot of Peaky Blinders in the Black Country Living Museum. And in the first series of Peaky Blinders, because it's Peaky Blinders is set, or, or where the family are based is Birmingham. And um, but they had some black country characters and the actors that they had were not um, specialists in the accent. And so and people picked up on it. And so for the next series, they said, look, we want some proper black country people to come. So we have the authentic accents. And so from that point on, Peaky Blinders has been really good for having, you know, um, black okay. country accents and black country. Well, that's a, that's a great tip for anyone with black country answers, especially if they're not in the UK and they want to hear what the accent's like, is to go and watch um, some of the later, see if you can Google the characters and find out which ones are from yeah, the black country. Yeah, you should put a little bit of a warning on Peaky Blinders. It's definitely something to watch later in the evening. It's not, yeah, it's every adult. Yeah. <laughs> stress. I don't want anyone taking the five-year-olds. The five-year-olds go to the Black Country Living Museum. That's a safe, <laughs> that's a safer option. <laughs> I'll make sure I put a warning on the blog post. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my bless her. My cousin's obviously watching this and she's just popped in to, to say to me, because my cousin's slightly older than me as well. So just go to show, check with your family members yeah, about, check, mem about yeah. your memories because my yeah. cousin's very kindly just said to me, we went to the Iron Bridge Living Museum. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So that's where my memory has got uh, muddled, which is appropriate. I've been emailing everyone all week about um, misremembering in my. <laughs> in yeah, no, it's it's example. really important, and and that's the thing with um, when you're talking to living relatives like grandparents. It's um, you know, what one family member remembers is not the same as another one, and and a representation of um, um, some of their family might not be the same. You know, like they might yeah. like one member of the family and. Um, you know, that doesn't mean to say that person was, um, uh, in, you know, perfect. And the same when people don't like them, they're not 100% bad. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's really true. Very true. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, have you got any favourite ancestors? Um, my black country ones. I mean, I, I really like the, um, my female line. So it's, it's my mum's family that come from the black country and I did um do you know those color charts where you you put um you, some people do it by country some people do it by county uh, one of those excel sheets showing uh, things and so all of her great grandparents are from Stafford were born in Staffordshire her grandparents were born in Staffordshire her parents were born in Staffordshire she was born in Staffordshire and then um the great great grandparents there's um Warwickshire Worcestershire which are right next to um the, the area and then um there's a couple of um wild cards there's uh, one who was in Ipswich but she, she, that, it was an aberration because they were they were from Shropshire and then um there was one from Wales but apart from that they were all from Staffordshire and on, on so on the female line mother of the mother of the mother uh, so I've gone back to my fifth great grandmother um end of the um 18th century and um she was called Elizabeth Holmes she died and was buried in Sedgley and um on that line, everyone apart from me were born within a two mile radius. So yeah, so we're right back there. And I, I did actually live in the black country once. I lived there when I was a baby for four months. So <laughs> that was, and that was within that two mile radius. So I'm, I'm very interested on the female line and everything that's on. I'm, my great grandmother, who my grandmother didn't like at all. Um, and she ran a shop in, so in um, Bloomfield Road in Tipton. And people do tend to remember her because I, I, I met some when I meet people, I say, oh, do you know my great uncle? He's got the blue plaque. And then they'll say, something like, oh, I didn't know him, but I knew his mother and, you know, because she had the shop. So she was kind of well known. And she was a very, um, very hard woman, very financially focused. My, my grandma was saying. But I, I think that's because she grew up in such poverty, like really, really extreme poverty. And she had 10 children and three uh, well, four of them yet died young, but three, the little girls, um, all died when they were uh, little babies. And that was, I know, it's really, yeah. it's really hard. And, and that's when they lived and that's when they were so poor. And her husband, um, he had um, rheumatoid arthritis. 
And so she couldn't, um, he, he became an invalid. So she had to take everything on. And so she took on the shop and she ran the shop. And then, um, she, but she was very, very tough. And then um, she's quite an interesting character. I wouldn't say she was my favorite because I know that she was, she was hard. You know, she would hit the children and she would, she was tough, but she's, um, her toughness is quite interesting. And, yeah. and, then, um, I've, I've, and then also on that line, my fourth great grandmother, Violetta, she died in 1832 when there was a cholera outbreak. So I haven't been able to prove that she died of cholera, but she died in an area which had cholera at that particular time. And she was 23 when she died. And she has so many descendants alive today, which I think is amazing. You know, she only lived for those 23 years. And yet, I mean, in terms of the mitochondrial DNA, which goes down that um, maternal line. So I have that in me, you know, so she, she that part of her is still alive in me. And in my mum and my sister, so um, yeah, that is, it's really interesting. No, it is incredible. And sometimes when you find these ancestors where their spouses um, or their parents did die very, very young, especially when they then later remarry and have other children, and you think, I'm from that first person that I, that, that was there for like, I don't know the flutter of an eyelash, wouldn't they? The, the, like kind of a blink in time, and yeah. Yeah, that had such a big impact because if they hadn't existed. Yeah and have lived just about long enough to have children I wouldn't be here or it'd be different you know yeah it, it does kind of in some ways it's kind of hard to get your head around it sort of gets you gets you thinking about lots of philosophical things I think so right. so your ancestor was a shopkeeper in um, the black country but traditionally what sort of industries and um, occupations are associated with the black country okay so brick making definitely is that there was uh, there were lots of um, brick making going on um, right back to about 1500 um in in that area um and that was something that women did as well not just okay. men so um I'm trying to think of the other um and there's chain making and again women did that there were women in the mines i mean there was so there were mines in the area but there weren't in the more recent years you don't tend to find women in the mines so much but um um coal mining um so my great grandfather oh i've got a picture of my great grandfather here he is um so he handily, he's, he's on my book, so I can promote my book. Oh, my great <laughs> oh, the same point. Uh, oh, so I'm having trouble with the... There he is. Can Thank you see you. it? Yes. There he is. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Lovely task. So, yeah, exactly. So he's called Edward, and he was he worked in Baggeridge Colliery. Um, so he lived in Coesley, and that was not far away. Um, so he... And he used to do magic tricks, and then... Um, entertain me yeah so so that's the thing when you were saying about they had this life of drudgery it's that, that there were other things going on I and mean, my grandma was a singer and um amateur actress so and then um, she she took part in all kinds of musical activities and her father was um a pianist a musician and a uh, church organist and then um, and you know the church activities they did loads of church activities my grandma was in the mother's union later but even earlier took part in like teas and fates and um so there's a sunday school and all the other events so but they often had a rich cultural life you know outside yeah. of if you think even of what you could do, even even if you just went to your local pub down the corner, they, mm. they aren't like pubs now. You would have had coits and skittles and um, yeah, absolutely. card games and all sorts going yeah. on and, and organised activities. And um, yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I think underneath there was a, um, a kind of rich kind of entertainment industry in lots of different forms. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, so sorry, there were coal mines. I mean, one of my ancestors, um, uh, which one was it? Henry Edwards. Henry Edwards, yeah, he died in a coal mine. Um, you know, so health and safety wasn't a strong point of the area. <laughs> that's, that's an understatement. I mean, you know, the, the death certificates and newspaper accounts, um, you know, for, for inquests and things were absolutely horrific. You know, some of the way that people died. I mean, um, a lot of my ancestors, actually, the male ancestors, were um, iron puddlers. So they worked in the iron industry. So literally, like, stirring these vats of... Molten hot. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's hot, top, top, top work. Um, so. Louise here just says um, that her Louise. black country folk were or were yes. or are very, very no nonsense people. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> how it is. That it's it's so it's very straight talking, very unpretentious, and also with a fantastic sense of humour. So I was okay. saying that my great uncle was a stand up comedian, but I mean, everyone's funny. Everyone, it's just constant jokes. Like uh, everyone I know from the black country is just really, you know, it's just 
always joking. And that's the thing, like, you, growing up with my grandparents, it was just, every, you just laughed at everything. And so sometimes I meet people who have no sense of humor and it's just, I don't know what to do there. <laughs> they're, just, they're just constantly making little jokes, you know, because that's what I was brought up with. Louise agrees. Yeah. <laughs> A big shout out from the black country people. Yeah. <laughs> What kind of humour would you describe it as? Is it kind of a, a dry, like a, dry, dry. <laughs> <laughs> best? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So, um, so you talked about your favourite ancestor. Do you have? And I know when I think of the Black Country, I tend to think of the nineteenth century because of that industrialisation. But do you have a favourite time period? And if so, why? <laughs> um, I really like the um, early twentieth century. Actually, probably um, you know, the sort of between the wars period is really interesting Probably, yeah from the first world war to the second world war and and there were lots of changes in the black country then i mean my grandpa sometimes he worked in the steelworks when other times he um did building and he, he ran his um, building firm and he actually built his own house so the house my mum grew up in he he built that which is amazing and um, and that there was a big boom um in the black country in in the 1930s with them um, housing so that would have been an interesting time and they did all sorts of things. Your grandpa would play cricket and they used to um, go all over the place to all the, have these cricket matches. They were really lovely cricket um, pitches in all sorts of places. Place I think it's called Himley Hall, which is not far from Dudley. Okay. I don't remember that name from that scene. So that's, or, or, I saw that, that seemed like a lovely place to go. Okay, yeah. I Yeah, I, it's, it's always really interesting to hear um, uh, why, why people like certain time periods and, and um, more than others. But do you find, because it's quite challenging, or it can be quite challenging in between wars because of the, or hopefully getting the 1921 census very soon, but mm. you've had that gap between 1911 census and then the 1939 National Register. And obviously the 1939 National Register has names and dates of births and addresses and occupations, which is fantastic, but uh, but not necessarily it doesn't necessarily say the connection between people and some records are obviously still close. So do you think it's the challenge of that period that makes you um, enjoy it or do you enjoy it despite the challenging elements of it? Um, I probably enjoy it despite the challenges. Uh, and I mean, there's um, that period is still just about accessible with um, living relatives who are living right now. You know, so um, my grandparents, um, they would be over 110 now, so you know, they're, they're not alive. But I, I have their memories, and I did used to interview my grandma. My grandma was nearly 97 when she died, so um, so she was around for a long time. And um, I used to interview her, but I used to write things down, and then I, later on I, I recorded her, so I have her voice and things. But um, that, that so um, that uh, living relatives are very useful. But some of the things that she used to say w was a bit confused, and it took me time to unravel it and then but you can do it I mean there are it's you probably need to go to local archives though um to do some of the work um you know things like um I've just said my grandma was involved with the church and so things like church magazines and Sunday school guides and parish uh, parish magazines and um um and and things from the leisure activities um so um programs theatre programs and um for, from the different groups that they were in sport groups so they're the cricket um groups and the football teams and you know the amateur teams that um they would participate in so sometimes programs and um or guides or team sheets or things they can find their way into the local archives and um that can be interesting to explore from that period i mean there's electoral registers that should be accessible from yeah. that time and then also newspapers, and there's more um, coming onto the uh, British newspaper archive all the time. So that's always, you know, every week there's something that you could maybe look through. Yeah, I think but, anyone who's watched Twice Remove will know that the newspapers is my absolute favourite resource of all time. <laughs> but, but, but particularly for that period, the 1920s, yeah. 30s, they are really good for that time. And um, that they tend to be good for um, the court cases and the inquests and things. They'll tend to be detailed and and quote people it seems to be um verbatim um or, or at least as as well as they copied at the time but um so you, you do get quite a detailed insight into the way people spoke and details on things like what they wore and um how they lived and where they lived and, they, and again think you know places like the black country living museum are pretty good on the early 20th century as well in terms of the detail and yeah. the the items that they have in the house and things they, they take time to research that properly so 
I think it's always worth checking the uh, British Library oral history collection as well because they do have a database of accents and interviews yeah. with people from different regions so even though you might not find it, obviously your own ancestor you might find um sorry my light's just gone off that's why I was throwing slightly um you might find um you know a recording from somebody who's from the same area and therefore they've got the same accent and perhaps they'll be going down the same roads and it starts to starts to give you a bit more of a, a view of what their what their life would be like just yeah. bear with me whilst I just try and fix my light which has gone out I mean another thing would be um uh autobiographies and memoirs of, oh yeah that's a good idea so you know some cases famous people some cases not but I mean um and when I say famous it's you know famous-ish for, for the time and the area so it might not be people who we think are celebrities but um but there'll be people that certainly the local archives will know about and you know you can just sort of say have you got a, a biography or, or memoir of someone who was in the 1920s in Tipton and then yeah and then um then you can look through that and you can see sometimes the names that are revealed in those sort of documents are, are amazing and you can well find your ancestor but they won't necessarily be indexed and so you know you're going to have to search quite hard yeah yeah no no I think I think you're well I know you're completely right and um it is about putting in that extra extra effort and I think it it then it therefore helps if you have a particular interest in that time period because it, yeah. it kind of spurs you on through the difficult the difficult times um so i was gonna just ask you another question about the black country but before i do brian has just uh just noticed brian's comment near the beginning where he says does emma have a suffolk connections because jolly was the maiden name of my great grandmother and um It'd be so amazing if there was a, a twice from your cousin connection made live. <laughs> so I thought I'd flash it up on screen. <laughs> well, with the, the jolly surname, it's a nickname. Okay, so it means that our ancestors were um, cheerful, happy Not people. Nice. Yeah, no, it's nice. But um, and there tend to be enclaves of jollies. So there is an enclave in Suffolk. There's an enclave in Cornwall, Lancashire, um, and then scotland king cardenshire aberdeenshire part of scotland and my jollies are from the king cardenshire aberdeenshire part of scotland not suffolk i'm afraid so <laughs> <laughs> ah, it'll happen one day <laughs> there'll be a live connection um so um so do you think you look at just thinking about the the events you know 1900 the second world war do you think you look at events differently when you find a connection to your own family within that within that event or you you find your own ancestor in that event yeah i mean i think um um war you know when i research war it's 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 something that i research through individual stories and then um, certainly my black country connections to both wars actually um do make me look at it in a perhaps a, a, a different way from how i would previously in my um my great grandfather couldn't serve in the war because i think he was just a little bit too old but also he had um rheumatoid arthritis he wouldn't have been able to and then um, but he had um two brothers um two full brothers and then his his father had died and then his mother had remarried and so he had other siblings um with that and um one of his full brothers died and then so there were just the two that one then went the other one went to war and came back from war and then in 1920 died of tb which is awful and then but I, you know, I wonder with it whether whether his lungs were weakened perhaps in some way so that's something to explore further and then but then were with his um his half brother he had a half brother who was a lot younger and he went to war and he was killed and there was no body and there's a um memorial to him and i've been to see that but um, that, you know, I just think about that and the, the length of time in which they, they wouldn't have known whether he was alive or dead, I mean, even he would have been missing, but it's, they wouldn't have known then to, to not have a body and all there is is a memorial, but it's far away. Yeah, it's horrendous. incredibly, incredibly hard. I know my great, uh, so my great grandfather on my mother's mother's side um, died, you know, in his early 30s in World War Two. And um, my great grandmother, my mum always says to me that my great grandmother every year used to have flowers arranged to mm. uh, be put on his grave in Tunisia. And um, she found it very difficult when some of the bodies from the Falklands War were, yeah. were repatriated back home. It made her really angry, but it was yeah. a jealous. It was a jealousy because mm. she she envied them that having that place, I guess. Yeah. Um, 
and um, years and years later when she was in her 80s she went back to Tunisia to revisit his grave and there were no oh, flowers wow. there yeah oh, they did they did like a family trip so I was a child I was very young so I didn't go but my but my mum and her sister and um, and their cousins all went and there's some video footage that's survived from like um, early video camera days in, in like the early 90s so yeah. Um, so yeah she did in her 80s she took a pilgrimage out there Oh, um, and actually got to see his grave in person and they arrived and there were no flowers there so all this time she'd been sending these flower money for flowers to be yeah. put on and there were none had been being put on but this very kindly caretaker in the church came over and rushed over and got a load of flowers for her to put down so I've funnily enough we rediscovered the video recently on an old video cam and I watched it and it really made me cry it was just oh. really really it was really really poignant and you could see all the emotion on her face and I mean yeah. he died when she was in her 30s and she was in her 80s and she never stop talking about him so oh, no, I do that, think I do think that um, personal connection um, yeah makes a really really big difference and sometimes yeah. even when you when you didn't know somebody and you find an ancestor that was involved in a, in, in an event you know like whether that's you know the first world war or uh, like you say a cholera epidemic it does make you look at it on a much more personal level I think mm. um yeah but you yeah. can see the effects, so not just in terms of the person who died, but the effects on all of the family who were left behind. And then mm -hmm. thinking of that great grandfather again, I mean, he just, it's just death after death in, in his family. And then, and he had, um, well, he had many cousins, though, you know, they're big families, so there are many cousins, but um, two of his cousins were um, footballers. So one of them played for England, and well, he was famous, I mean, very famous. Um, he was called Joe Smith, and then his brother, Phil, who's actually responsible for the um, introduction of transfer deadline day, if you know anything about football. <laughs> but this, is, this is a true fact. So it's a Rick Glanville, the Chelsea historian, um, told me about that because um, um, Phil played for Chelsea briefly. But um, Phil was killed in the First World War. So both Phil and Joe uh, were in the war, but um, yeah, Phil was killed. So I mean, just um, for my great grandfather, it's like death after death after death and just... You know, the, the First World War must have just been horrific for families, especially, you know, you think of um, tightly knit um, families yeah. in the black country living in these um, streets, sort of with terraces and living on top of each other and, and working in places like the ironworks and the mines very closely together. And, you know, just every time somebody had a loss in, in the war, it would have reverberated. Yeah, of course it would have done, and then and then you, that's why you have women that were that were really strong and re, were really hardy because they had to be. They didn't have any choice, did they? Mm. I guess. Mm. But, I mean, I, just anyone watching who's like new to family history, I think as as much as you kind of commiserate with the losses and it does make you connect with them, just to reassure people, you do also get to really celebrate when you find a family that's that's had a success because you know where they're from. You know, you know, mm. you, you find that ancestor that kind of. I don't know, escaped from being a general labourer and, and got a skilled trade and did a little bit better in life. You you really celebrate them because you know where they've come from. Um, and obviously war heroes and all those kind of, you know, fantastic stories as well. So just, just in case anyone's new to family history and is watching and going, oh, I'm not sure I like the sound of all that death. <laughs> there's, there's good there's good times too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, have you done a um, DNA test yet? Oh, I've done lots of DNA tests. Yeah, my DNA's out there. I've got I've lots and lots of black country DNA matches, loads of them, which is nice. It's quite, quite reassuring. Um, my um, my paper research has been supported by all my DNA, which is really, really nice because there are some um, people that I made contact with um, on this side. So one who's – so I said that my uh, my great-grandfather, he had his um, mother had remarried, so she re remarried a butcher in Coventry which I think was kind of like a step up, you know, kind of <laughs> there was a um, <clears throat> man with his butcher shop. And um, and I was in touch um, with um, someone on that line. So he's descended from her, Sarah, she's called Sarah Smith, she's called, and, um, and, but not the, but not the um, same great, great grandfather. But um, um, he just came up um, recently as a D DNA match. I was like, oh yeah, we're a match, that's cool. And so, yeah. Do you think do you think it's influenced the way you research or um or who you research? Um in in terms of, in oh, terms the of DNA DNA test. Mm, oh yeah, yeah. Do you think yeah, it makes you look at 
lines that you hadn't before or, or oh yeah it, it does when you find something you think oh hang on who's this how am i related to this person so you do but yeah, i find i find myself researching down the tree a little bit so yeah. my, my latest match came from my heritage that was um somebody who um so my great great grandmother the, the brick maker she um so her husband had died and then she had all these sons who were minors including um edward who i showed you and some of them moved as part of a scheme well there was a scheme where um people um moved from bilston which where she was doing to royston in south yorkshire near Bar barnsley and um oh, west yorkshire so, and um and they um and so she moved so she lived in the black country her whole life her family were from there and then they went over to yorkshire and i've just completely forgotten what your question was there's <laughs> oh, what's, what's your question that's okay i'm glad it's not just me who does that um, <laughs> yeah, it's, um how was your i forget what i've asked so don't worry um how was your uh taking your dna test influence your research right right, right 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 so yeah. so these she went there and her, her sons but not my great grandfather my great grandfather stayed and and um so i was quite interested in this and that she'd gone with this this kind of mining world and so she was part really part of these mining communities and um and it was her father who died in the mine as well he died in the mining accident okay. so um you know it's it, the um, mining was just part of her world even though she um, wasn't personally going down the line but um but i was really interested in what happened in yorkshire and whether i had um any family members who still lived in those mining areas because they were the mining areas that were involved with the the miners strikes of the um 1980s and i was just thought that's that's an interesting be interesting to find those connections and so somebody yeah popped up on the dna match the other day and i was like, oh okay let's... so i was having a little look at, at, at that part of the family oh. for that reason I was on um, Facebook the other day and I was scrolling through the videos and um, a clip of Sarah Milligan came up, the comedian Sarah Milligan came up and she was telling a, um, a joke about discovering that Margaret Thatcher invented Mr. Whippy ice cream. Uh, it was part of the study, apparently. She was part of the team that came up with like, the, the <laughs> idea that you could aerate ice cream. and, and Oh, because she, she was a chemist. Was yeah, 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 apparently, okay. and um, and she had to tell her father this, and her father was from a really they're from a really strong mining community, and um, and it was a big the conversation. <laughs> yeah, and at the conversation, he she said like, "How do you feel, Dad? That you know somebody that we just dis dislike so much or have such opposing political views to, has done this thing that is a good thing." Like she was using it as an example of <laughs> she was using it as an example of people you don't get on with that, that do good things and right, right, right. that way in her joke, you know, and. Um, and he turned around and said, you can't eat Mr. Whippy ice cream anymore. Um, but listening to it, it immediately made me, and I don't know whether you're like this when you hear things like that, it made, immediately made, made me want to go, I now want to trace Sarah Milligan's family tree to just see mm -hmm. how far back that mining link goes and just how yeah, yeah. it, it is yeah, in her. Absolutely. And actually, did she have yeah. any people that had opposing views and what's in her family tree? It kind of like grabs you, doesn't it, I think? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, what tips would you give anyone who is interested in perhaps they think they've got black country ancestors or they've just discovered they've got a black country connection um and perhaps they're a little bit too far away to go to the black country museum if you yeah. <laughs> no, they can't go there this doesn't matter they can't go there. That's definitely the top tips so. yeah, that's the top tip yeah but also they they do have a lot of um youtube videos Okay. So you can you can start watching their YouTube videos that they made a whole load during lockdown and their TikTok is if anyone's on TikTok their TikTok is um was the most popular in I don't know whether it's in the heritage sector or something but um yeah so you, ha you have a look at all their social media things um and I've got some some books oops some what have we got here so this this is a good book tracing your black country ancestors okay by Michael Pearson. Oh, I'll pop a link on my on the accompanying blog post. Is it pen and sword book? You see that? Yeah. The, the, that, that's the crooked house. That's okay. a pub. It's that's a what, a sorry? Pub. It's a pub and it's literally crooked. When you stand in front of it, it's like it's it's surreal. So yeah, you have to visit the black country and go and visit that pub. Um and then um Oh yeah, I found this the other day. So, so I think you should look up my um, my great uncle's poetry, obviously. So, hey, Harry Harrison, you go and have a look at that. And then there's this 
woman, uh, poet, uh, Liz Berry. Oops. And she's done, um, she also writes in the Black Country dialect and she's a, con she, she writes now. She's an, uh, a current poet. And so she's written uh, this collection called Black Country and this is brilliant. And if you want to have a little taster of um, Black Country words and she she has a little glossary underneath. Um, so this is, is quite a nice way in. And, um, and this is, contemporary black country but it draws on on the past so this is quite a nice little way of getting used to the language and the dialect um and then this one this is written by um yeah where's it called simon briarcliffe simon's really good he's on twitter if you're not following him probably should be following him he works for the black country living museum and he wrote this forging head this is this is a lovely book with loads of lovely pictures and maps and things um, I would say that you do need to look at maps a lot because um, the changes in administration and the way um, the way the people at the time referred to areas is very confusing because I, I have all these different addresses for my ancestors. And when I tried to plot them on maps, they were all, you know, kind of within a very, very small radius. And I'd be saying to my mum, where is this? And she'd say that's Coesley, but then there were all these other different names. I mean, there was um, so Sedgley, Bilston, and then there was another area called Sodom, which is well, um, yeah, well, my brickmaker ancestor lived Sodom. So yeah, <laughs> okay, but um, I'm pretty sure well, he doesn't it. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was it was you know it, it was scary area i mean so in this is quite a famous um quote from um because an american consul um visited the area in 1862 and he described the area as being black by day and red by night so like literally in the day you know even if there was a blue sky or something it would be black because of all the soot from all the different furnaces and all the different industries and at night it was red with all the fires red sky and there's actually a fantastic painting uh, which includes a red sky it's, it's a really famous painting but um yeah just investigate black country culture because it is it there is rich and the humor and everything yeah. okay great um before we wrap up i just wonder if anyone has any more questions um please do pop them in the comments but i will also make sure that all those resources are on the accompanying blog but um before i let you go if there was anyone it's probably unlikely, but if there is anyone who sat here who's maybe dabbled in a bit of family history and thought, I'm not sure whether this is for me, um, you know, I'm very busy, what would you say to somebody who was kind of on the fence about doing their family history? Um, I'd say um, just explore it. <laughs> there's, there's so many different avenues to explore. So, you know, if you're thinking, oh, I don't want to find something, saying, it just, yeah, look at some things. Look, look at the things that interest you, I guess. So if you're into sport, maybe look at your ancestors and see if they did any sport. Or if you're interested in travel, have a look at that. Yeah, I don't know. I think some people think are put off because they think um, it's going to be laborious and... Um... Uh, and it's complicated and I think actually once you've got your head around the basics if you keep kind of plugging away at the basics it comes quite once you've got that, that kind of birth marriage death census that kind of stuff just get started mm. with. once you've got it clicked you kind of you, you're kind of away really um, it's, it's a good way of talking to living relatives as well yeah uh, you know, if you if you haven't spoken to like a grandparent or a great uncle or even a parent or a sibling for a while then um, you know it's, it's a good opportunity and you can check your me own memories and even just um, researching your own life is quite useful, you know, researching life, especially when the bit before you were, can remember that, you know, have you got all the details on that? Have you got all the details of the all the schools you went to and all, all the streets you've lived on? So no, I think that's a really good tip, actually, a really good tip. Um, OK, thanks so much. Emma. Where, where can everyone come and find you? They want to find out a bit more about you. And, and I know you've written lots of books, so. Um, yeah, my website is emmajolly.co.uk and then um, I'm on Twitter and I usually respond to, well, yeah, I always respond <laughs> to, to <laughs> tweets. So you can come find me on Twitter if you want to ask me anything. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Emma. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you. And I will make sure everything is on that accompanying blog post and now I'll do the awkward bit where I lose my mouse and then, yeah, find it again, then hit hit end and it takes like 10, 20 seconds to actually end and it's really awkward. <laughs> so just, okay. we'll just wave and smile. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>